Hey guys, today I thought I would share with you some things I have encountered while working as an OBGYN LPN for about six months now, and these things that I wrote down can go for any nursing department where a nurse is working. The types of things that I wrote down, it can go for anyone in any nursing department. Everyone will experience this if you work in the healthcare field, so um, yeah. Let's just go ahead and get started because there is a lot of things that I wrote down. Um, the first one is rude patients. So I encounter rude patients on a daily basis and basically the thing I keep telling myself in the back of my mind is to kill them with kindness. You always want to keep it professional. You also don't know what that person is going through on the outside of your facility. You don't know what they've been going through that day or that week or that month and you just never want to take it personal. You kind of just want to be like, oh, everybody has bad days and just let it roll off your shoulder and keep it moving because most of the time they just don't realize they're taking it out on you or acting the way they're acting, but they're doing it. So you just can't take it personal. You're going to encounter that a lot. I encounter at least two to three rude patients per day. Um, the next thing is the sad or upset patients. We get a lot of sad patients due to miscarriages, especially the like younger couples that just got married and they've been trying to conceive or the married couples that have been married for six plus years trying to conceive and they're infertile um, and then they finally conceive and then they lose the baby. They get very sad and upset. Also, a diagnosis. Younger Women that come into our practice get diagnosed with cysts or um, fibroids, endometriosis, PCOS, something like that, or infertility, and they get really sad and upset about it. So you just need to be there for them, be that shoulder to cry on or the person that they can vent to, offer a hug if they'll take it, or if they ask for a hug, hug them. Or for me, like I can tell when someone just needs a hug, so I'll just be like, come here and like grab them so you always want to be there for that patient no matter what the situation is. Um, you're going to encounter a lot of late patients. So my works protocol is if you're a new patient and your appointment is scheduled at 145, you are to show up 30 minutes prior to that time to fill out the chart for abstraction which is like the questionnaire. You fill out your name, how how old you were when you had sex, when you started your period, all that good stuff. And a lot of times patients show up at 145 instead of 115 or they show up a little bit after that appointment. And that can get a little frustrating because that not only puts you behind doing your intake, but it'll put the doctor behind because certain doctors, like my doctor, likes to meet the new patient before they just go in and do your exam and, you know, be all up in your personal space. So that puts everybody behind. So if anything, um, and I do this as a patient myself, you know, when I'm going to any appointment, I always try to get there early just so that I'm on time and I don't put the other nurses and healthcare workers behind because it's frustrating, especially now that I work in the field. It's like, really? So the next thing is lazy coworkers. You don't want to be that nurse. You don't want to be the nurse that everyone says, oh, I don't really like working with her because she doesn't do her job right or she never stocks the rooms or her intake isn't complete or anything like that. And she's not a team player. I am a team player. I love helping to just get the job done. So don't be that nurse that people kind of gossip behind your back about and say that you're kind of the lazy worker because nobody wants to work with that. Um, another thing you're going to probably encounter is baby fever. So when women come in for their six week OB postpartum visit and we do their exam, um, sometimes I will hold the infant while mom's in getting her exam because the baby will start crying or something like that. So when I'm holding these like six week old babies, I'm just like, oh my gosh, even though I don't want children right now at this point in my life, like ever, um, I'm going through one of those phases. I hold these infants and I'm just like, oh my gosh, like just the smell of them because they're so clean and just so cute in their little hands. I get baby fever and then I'll see like crazy toddlers running around and I'm like, no, I'm not doing that. So expect to have baby fever if you work in the OBGYN field or labor and delivery because phew, it's real. Next thing is 
encountering young people that are pregnant. We've been having a lot of pregnancy confirmations in like 14, 15 year olds and times have changed. Women, young women are developing a lot faster and hormones are just going crazy in kids. So you cannot judge this person for doing what they do. Everyone has their own life for a reason and when they come in for pregnancy confirmation, you know, the doctor will talk to them about how hard it is to raise a child, especially at their age, all the risks that come with them being pregnant at such a young age, and then them, along with their family members, you know, they have to decide if they're going to keep the baby or not, and that is kind of hard to deal with because I know when I was 14 and 15, I was just like skateboarding and hanging out with my friends. I wasn't thinking about sex at that time. So to see how times have changed and like 14 year olds are coming in for pregnancy confirmation, it's like, okay, how are we going to go about this? Because she doesn't have a car to drive herself to her appointments. Her parents work. She's still in school. Like, I think a lot of people just act on their emotions before they think things fully through and that's why we're seeing so many young people get pregnant. Also, schools, I don't know about y'all's area, but in my area, when I went to school, we had sex ed in middle school and high school, and now, like, I hear from my nephew that, like, they're doing sex ed in elementary school, in fifth grade, and fifth grade, like, I was just stressed out about SOLs. I wasn't even thinking about having sex at all, but because young women are developing so quick at such a young age, you know, their hormones are raging, and... I think depending on who teaches the sex ed classes and the way they approach it, some of these kids might just want to try it because of what they're hearing in the class. Or if they don't have open parents to talk to and they're scared to talk to them about getting birth control or using condoms or whatever, um, I feel like that's part of the reason why so many young kids are conceiving at such a young age because they're scared to talk to their parents about sex. My parents were very open about everything and when I had questions about it, I would just ask them open table and they would be like, this is why. Um, if you're going to have sex, use condoms and birth control. You don't want to get pregnant. And I'm like, okay, cool. And I'm 25 and I have no kids. Plus, in high school, we had like that class where you take the baby home and I did it for a weekend, and I was like, I don't want this. Like, no, I just want to graduate high school and go to college. Like, it was so stressful. So, expect to, especially in this field, you are going to see a lot of young people with STDs and pregnancies. Um, and that's the next thing on my list, is STD screening. So, we have a lot of people coming in to just ask, like, oh, I need to be tested for STDs. And you will encounter people that have never even been sexually active that want STD screening and it's like, you know, why do you want that? But you'll also get a lot of people who have multiple partners that want to be tested. So, of course, you want them tested for everything. And I always double check with them what they want to be tested for. So, when they come in and they're like, oh, I want an STD screen. Okay, well, do you want the full panel? Because the full panel will do the blood work. Um, we'll test you for the HIV and, you know, full panel. Like, we'll test you for gonorrhea, chlamydia, syphilis, hep C, hep B, everything. And that can be expensive. A lot of insurances only cover a portion of it or they don't cover it at all. My insurance sucks and that's why I owe patient first so much money. But, yeah, so... Blood work is expensive, but it is great that so many people want to be tested because we are seeing a lot of chlamydia in my area. So you definitely want to be safe and always promote safe sex to your patients, especially the young ones. It's like, you know, you're not married. You don't know if this person is clean or what they're doing on the side. So always use protected sex, condoms, birth control. Withdrawal method is not 100% and a lot of people don't believe that. So you just have to really educate your patients when they're in front of you, especially if they're kind of new at it. Like if this is their first partner ever and they're not on birth control, they use condoms sometimes, you really want to educate them on why it's important to be on birth control if they're not planning on having a child because condoms don't work all the time. They break. Um, sometimes it's the heat of the moment and you just want to have sex. So you definitely want to promote safe sex. Um, the next thing is... 
patients that ask you questions that you don't know the answer to. So this has happened to me like in the last two weeks. Patients will ask me questions about something that I haven't encountered yet. So I'm like, okay, well, let me ask the room nurse and try to find out for you. And then if it's something I know that the doctor can answer, I'll be like, oh, well, you can just discuss that with the doctor when they come in the room. And they're like, oh, okay. So don't ever give false information when a patient asks you a question. So if they ask you something and you know the answer, give it to them. If they ask you something and you kind of know the answer, just be like, well, I do know that blah, blah, blah. But just to double check, ask the doctor when they come in the room. Or if you don't know at all, be like, you know, let me find that out for you. You don't ever want to give false information to a patient. The next thing that you're going to encounter in the workplace is gossip. That happens everywhere, in high school, at your job, whatever. You want to stay out of it. I am very quiet now because I'm starting to realize, like, who I work with and who I can trust and who I can't. So I'm very selective about how I act and what I do in front of certain people at work because some people don't have a great personality and like they don't believe in laughter in the workplace or trying to make work fun while you're working and taking it seriously. So certain people I act a certain way in front of because I know that they rat me out and they'll tell on me or they'll tell on whoever I'm talking to about whatever. So when you hear gossip in the lunchroom or someone comes up to you and says, hey, did you hear about this, that, or the other? Just be like, no, I didn't, and then just keep it moving. Don't get involved in that kind of stuff. Save the drama for your mama. I have said that in plenty of my nursing videos, especially throughout nursing school. Um, you just don't want to be involved in it. The other thing you need to plan for is crazy schedules slash crazy days at work. So sometimes people call out. Sometimes you'll be working with two doctors and you're also going to be on injections, which has happened to me. Um, sometimes you're only going to have a half day schedule with some doctors, so you might want to jump and try to help someone else, but then you might get called to do an injection or be called to hook up an NST. You just need to be ready for the hecticness because especially Mondays, I call them manic Mondays, Mondays are just crazy. Sometimes Fridays get really crazy, especially if it's going to be a full moon that weekend. So. You just really want to be prepared. You always want to go into work kind of optimistic, like today's going to be a great day, and you just got to keep telling yourself that. Even if it gets so stressful and overwhelming, just keep moving. Keep trying to get things done. Try to be a team player. Um, try to get other nurses to help as well, and just get the job knocked out. The next thing is learning different providers preferences so certain doctors at my practice like certain things like they like the non-latex non gloves or they like the powder gloves or they don't use certain gels they don't use certain specs so you just have to learn what each provider likes and there's a couple of providers well I think I've worked with all the providers in my practice but there's still a couple that some use intake sheets some don't some want intake sheets on just OB patients, some don't want them on GYN and vice versa. So you just have to make a mental note or write it down in a notebook. I carry a notebook to work all the time and just remember what that provider likes in case you are pulled to work with them. Um, the next thing is sickness. So the flu is really high in my area even though it's like springtime and we have been using the red top antiseptic wipes to wipe down all of our pods, all of the exam rooms, spraying Lysol, like people are getting sick left and right in my practice and people are calling out because of it, their kids are sick and it's just gross and you always want to wash your hands, you always want to use the antiseptic wipes. After each patient I'm constantly bathing in hand sanitizer, that's why my hands are always dry, but I don't want to get sick. I was living on Claritin and Sudafed like a month ago because of my allergies and I was like, no, I definitely don't want the flu. So always, always wash your hands with warm soap and water. And sometimes um, you'll notice like if you're waiting for a patient to come out of the bathroom and the bathroom is, if it's near you, they won't wash their hands after they pee in a cup. And <laughs> you basically just have to like, I don't know. I always wipe my station down in between a certain amount of patients anyways and just try to keep it clean because that's gross. So yeah. Um, the next thing is blood transfusion questions. So 
We give a form to all new patients and every annual patient. It's a blood transfusion consent form, and it's just in case of a medical emergency, if they need to be rushed to the hospital, would they accept? And the number one question I get when I hand them that piece of paper is, well, why wouldn't someone accept this? Jehovah's Witness. Jehovah's Witness does not accept any blood product from any animal or any human. So in the event that they're bleeding out, they are going to bleed out. Um, and they're like, well, why would they do that? Because that's their practice. That's that's their belief. It's up to them. Also, we have a lot of people that don't want to accept blood from other people unless it's their family members, but we are not set up like that. Like, in an emergency, your loved one is not going to be able to have that much, that many quarts of blood pumped out of them and put into the bag to be infused into you. So they would match your blood type, give it to you, and try to save your life. Um, next one is patient's first GYN visit. So especially if they're like 14 or 15, it's very nerve-wracking. I remember my first visit and I was scared to death. So basically you just have to make them feel comfortable and make them feel welcome and just kind of tell them what to expect. Like, okay, well, since you're not sexually active and you're so young, she's probably just going to do a pelvic exam. She's not going to put a speculum in there. Because um, the specs do hurt. Like, hell. Like, <laughs> they hurt. Um, it's not everybody's favorite visit of the year, but women's health is so important, and it's important to keep up with all of your yearly pap smears. So you just want to tell the new patient that has never had an exam before what to expect and you also want to give them the information on any vaccines that you guys give out. I know that we do give out the Gardasil vaccine to help prevent HPV. Since working there I've only done maybe three of those. So you just want to promote and try to tell them how to take care of themselves and why it is important to take care of yourself. Um, the next one is patients who vent to you. So you're going to have a patient coming in for their annual or for discharge or for vaginal itching. And that is what they're there for, but they will start rambling about other personal things going on in their life. Like, my mom is sick, I have to start taking care of her, my dad just got out of the hospital, or my kids are doing this, my kids are doing that. And they just vent to you. And the way that I look at that is... Okay, they need someone to talk to, and that's why they're telling me, even though they're just here for vaginal discharge. So I let them vent, and I'm like, oh, okay, and I'll be listening to them, and I let them vent and get their frustration or whatever they need to talk about out. And then while they're talking, I'm still updating their chart and asking them questions and stuff. And then once that's over, I take them to the room and tell them that the doc will be in in just a moment. So even if they're just venting to me to help themselves feel better, I did my job. That's what I'm there for. You're, I'm here for you to talk to me and tell me your problems. Yes, it is supposed to be OBGYN related, but if you're having a bad day because you had a flat tire on the way to the doctor's office or your car broke down on the way to work and you want someone to yell at and vent to, that's why I'm here. Just tell me. Um, the next thing is patients who are so open about everything. Like, on the chart for abstraction, there is like a section that will ask you, you know, have you ever been diagnosed with STDs? How many lifetime partners have you had? How many current partners? Do you use protected sex, oral sex? And sometimes they are just so open that they will just start talking about everything they've done, positions they like, um, just crazy stuff. And, you know, it is good that they are that open because then we know like how to treat them in the event that they need certain testing for things or something, but sometimes it's mind-blowing that they are just that open and they just say what they say. <laughs> and it's, it, it catches me off guard sometimes, I'm not going to lie, but I would rather have an open patient that is more willing to just tell me honestly like how many partners they have or how many partners they have had because if you have a high number of partners, current or lifetime, that increases your chance of contracting an STD. So we want to be able to test you, treat you, and cure you if possible. The other thing is handicap patients. So 
we have patients that come in with schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, multiple personality disorder, or they are physically handicapped in a wheelchair. And a couple of our rooms have low enough exam tables where the loved ones and the nurses can lift them and put them on, or if they get dropped off by a certain medical company, um, all the nurses just get together and help them get up on the exam table because even if you're handicapped, you still have to receive care in all aspects, not just GYN care, but, you know, heart care, skin care, foot care, and you just have to work together to get that person on the exam table, especially if they can't walk if they're in a wheelchair, or sometimes they can help and pull themselves up on things, so you just have to be patient and really help that person get on the exam table because they are there to be healthy and just check up on themselves, so you will encounter people who have psych disorders or handicap disorders and you just have to roll with it and just work as a team to get them in, get their care done, and then send them on their way. The next one is the shy, quiet patients. So as an intake nurse, it is our job to be nosy. We want to know everything. Um, and some patients are embarrassed, some people are just shy, Sometimes they just don't want to talk to the nurse. They'd rather just talk to the doctor. So all the time in my note, the first thing I ask is, do you have any concerns? And they say no. So in the chart, reason for visit, patients here for annual, no concerns. And then when they get in the room and the doctor comes in, I can hear them and they'll just spill their guts out to the doctor. If they're comfortable talking to the doctor, as long as they are cared for, that's what matters. Um, I do wish that they would just tell me <laughs> since I am there that's my job but if they're not comfortable telling me that's their right they don't have to so I just keep it moving and then the next thing is a lot of paperwork so you know you're gonna have the HIV deemed consent you're gonna have the blood transfusion paperwork all of the new OB paperwork for cystic fibrosis carrier testing all kinds of blood work that you have to do when you're pregnant and then you have FMLA disability paperwork and chart for abstractions, which is the questionnaire that new patients fill out when you go to a new facility. And, you know, scanning that into the chart and making sure that everything is in there is just... It can be overwhelming because you have to make sure everything is signed and it's dated and it's in the right chart and it's labeled correctly. So, basically, right after the... We call it first round, which is the morning round, once that's over before we break for lunch... If I have time, I scan the paperwork into the charts. That way I know it's already done. And then at the end of the day, after the last patient leaves and I'm done, I go scan the second half. So you just have to really make sure that all your ducks are in a row. And everyone is going to have a way of doing things on their own. So some people might wait till the end of the day to scan all their paperwork. Some people like me do it halfway. You just have to find what works for you and what your routine is going to be. And the last thing that I wrote down was awesome coworkers. Some people that I work with are just teamwork makes the dream workers and they love to just get things done like me and just make it work. So being a nurse, you just have to be open to all possibilities and aspects. You're going to run into things and situations where you don't know what to do. And then a seasoned nurse will tell you like, okay, in the event that this happens again, this is how we handle it. And then I just pick up off of watching others. When I run into situations that I've never been in, I watch the seasoned nurse deal with it, and then that's how I know how to handle it next time. So just be observant. If you have questions at a new facility that you're working at, always ask. Always follow the rules and procedures and policies. Don't, you know, take any shortcuts. You always want to be a prudent nurse. You want to do your job correctly because... A, your job is on the line along with your license, and B, you're there for that patient's care. So if you guys have any other questions or suggestions for videos, please let me know like always, and I will make a new video for you guys soon.